my way they were trying to speak through a broken heart but only tears could say the sunset cast no shadow on the world's darkest day and with one last look they laid him in the grave but i talked to him today and my cares all fell away he made me feel like life had just begun he said all of my trials could be turned into triumph through the victory that he's already won and i talked to him today and the comfort that he gave fill me with desire to tell the world that on calvary he died but right now he is alive i know because i talked to him today mary magdalene came breathless to the place where peter lay he was searching through his broken heart trying to find the faith to pray but as he heard her joyful story his sorrow could not stay and his hopes rang out through the words he heard her say she said i talked to him today and thy cares all fell away he made me feel like life had just begun he said all of my trials could be turned into triumph through the victory that he's already won and i talked to him today and the comfort that he gave filled me with desire to tell the world that on calvary he died but right now he is alive i know because i talked to him today yes on calvary he died but right now he is alive i know because i talked to him true he came here 
to die. He rose from the grave, pulled that stone away, and I'm glad to say he's living again. And I'm glad to say. I'm glad he's living again, aren't you? They may have crucified him. He gave his life on the cross, but I'm glad he's not dead. One thing that sets our, uh, I hate to use the word religion, but we don't have religion. We have the Savior, amen. The thing that sets uh, Christianity apart from all other religions is the fact that our God's alive. Oh, they're serving dead gods, but I'm glad our God is very much alive, amen. All right, y'all come right on this morning. Uh, well, my mind went blank. I know their names. All oh, yeah. <laughs> Pray for TJ and Lacey this morning as they sing. Pray the Lord to bless them. You guys will get old one day and you have this uh, brain fog. And um, you, know, you know everything you used to know, you just can't find it. Amen. Since Jesus died for our sin, but something happened at the tomb where he lay. He came forth and the stone rolled away. I don't serve a dead Savior, I don't have a dead faith. He's alive, and so am I, brought forth from the grave. There is victory for the claiming every day and every hour. Raised to live forevermore in resurrection power. used to be my past is buried and my soul is free even death can never take my lasting hope heaven's mine for my redeemers I don't serve a dead savior I don't have a dead victory for the claiming every day and every hour raised to live forevermore in resurrection power hell is defeated he's broken every chain praise God the tomb is empty today For the claiming every day and every hour Raised to live forevermore In resurrection power There is victory for the claiming every day and every hour Raised to live forevermore In resurrection Lord, the 
tomb is empty, our Savior is alive. Appreciate that good singing this morning. It's a great blessing and uh, always a blessing to hear folks sing about the Lord. And I'm uh, glad we have a risen Savior. All right, you all come right on this morning, Keisha. Okay, you all going to sing? Yeah, you all sing this morning. Amen. You pray for them, they sing this morning. Um, so preacher, it's more singing than usual. Well, a lot of singing today. I've asked everybody to sing today. And so I'm enjoying it too. It's a blessing in my heart. Amen. You pray for them as they sing.
Bible says a name that's above every name. It's a name that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Holy is that name. Appreciate all the good singing this morning. It's been a tremendous blessing. The congregational singing, the individuals that have sang, we certainly have enjoyed that. But we've come to the preaching time now, so you be much in prayer for Brother Bob Bowen as he comes and preaches for us, a dear friend of ours from Scranton, Virginia. And you pray for him. Brother Bob, you come right on this morning and preach to our hearts. You pray the Lord to bless him and use him to be a blessing to us this morning, as I'm sure that he will. A great student of the Bible, a great preacher. We appreciate Brother Bob a great deal. Amen. You come right on, Brother. Good? Not good. There we go. Appreciate the opportunity, your pastor uh, asking me to come down and do the sunrise service this morning. And I love him so much. We've known each other for a good number of years now. Actually met going to the Philippines, and uh, it's funny how you meet somebody that way. We used to live in Stewart. It's been about 30, uh, 25, 30 years ago. But uh, yeah, now we're up near Stanton. But uh, met him when we went to the Philippines together on a missions trip and I uh, just right away fell in love with him as a dear brother and appreciate his fellowship and uh, this church too has been such a blessing to us down through the years and I, I thank you for that. All right, I'm going to be in several places this morning and with me that is not a good thing usually because the more scripture you give me the more I preach and I've got a lot of scripture. Uh, it is the scripture, the word of God that's going to get the job done. It's not Bob Bowen. It's not the church. It's not any talent or abilities that we have though God uses those. It is the word of God that reaches hearts and lives and changes people and exalts the Lord Jesus. I'm in Matthew chapter 27. Now, I've got an unusual thought this morning, but it'll be the final point of my message and the largest point. And I'm fearful I may not get there, or if I don't get there uh, at 11 o'clock, I'll just try and pick it up there. Uh, sometimes my messages are like trains. You know, they've got cars that couple together, just one after another. Well, I can just uncouple and pick up there on the next one. Uh, again, I do have a lot of scripture, and, and I'm trying to be as free of notes as I can because between that, that'll bog me down. You heard the story. I, my brother was a firefighter. My son-in-law is too for years. And uh, one day he was in the firehouse there, and this little old fellow, this little old drunk came in there. He didn't weigh 120 pounds soaking wet with rocks in his pocket. And he had a notepad and he's going around his, his house had burned down and he blamed it on the fire department not getting there in time to you know he was smoking in bed they're lucky to save the guy's life but he didn't appreciate that he blamed the firefighters but his house burned down so he comes in with this little notepad and he says what's your name son the guy told him he wrote his name down he pointed to another so what's your name boy he wrote his name down finally he points to this one big old boy about six foot five two seventy so what's your name boy he told him what his name was he said what do you want my name for he said, well, I'm making up a list here. All you guys let my house burn down. When I get my list complete, I'm going to come back and whoop every one of you. <laughs> that big old boy just grabbed him by the collar, picked him up like this, said, son, you ain't about to whoop me. He looked up and said, I'll just scratch you off the list. Then. <laughs> if I don't scratch something off the list, I might get whooped this morning. Matthew chapter 27, of course, we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is why really every Sunday right, right. is Resurrection Sunday. That's why it's Sunday, not Saturday. We don't worship on the Sabbath. We're not right. Jews. Amen. We're not Seventh-day disadvantaged. Excuse me. <laughs> the New Testament pattern is Sunday. Amen. That's when the church always worshiped. And so we worship on Sunday, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. In Matthew chapter 27, if you would, Matthew 27. And when you found that, if you want to slip your finger 
over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a familiar resurrection passage there. 1 Corinthians 15, Matthew 27. And then I'm going to give you another passage. If you will turn there after you find those. And that is the book of Titus chapter number 2. Book of Titus chapter number 2. Now if you don't know where those things are, just flip around when I start reading the scriptures, you look intelligently at the page in front of you like you do know it, and nobody will know any different. <clears throat> I've got a relatively new Bible, uh, and the pages still tend to stick a little, so I'm, I can be a little slow turning also. All right, Matthew chapter 27. In verse 1, the Bible says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Now I'm going to stop reading there and pray, and then try to get to the message God is laid on my heart. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this beautiful day. The good folks that are assembled here this morning, uh, this pastor in this church, we love so much, Lord, and we thank you for each and every one. And Father, my prayer is that you would be exalted here this morning, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up. Uh, Lord, that you'd hide me behind the cross and may the message go forward, the word of God, uh, Lord, that you've laid up my heart. We're praying for each and every soul here. We don't know the needs of any particular one. But God, you know each and every one. You know every man, every woman, every child that's here. You know what's in their heart. And you know what needs to be done and what you would accomplish. So Father, I pray that you speak to hearts through the word of God. The Holy Spirit would have free course here this morning. Direct me in everything I say and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Now... I'm going to come back here to Matthew. Again, it's going to be my final point, but I want you to flip over and look in chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. In verse number one, I, I, again, I'm going to read a lot of scripture and then try and move on. In the end of the Sabbath. Now, let me, let me help you with something right there. Typically, the Sabbath is Saturday. Okay, and the word Sabbath means rest. On the seventh day, the Lord rested. He commanded man to rest on the seventh day. He gave the children of Israel, listen to me, the children of Israel, the Sabbath as a day to rest and worship him. And so the Sabbath that we are looking at in this verse is Saturday. It's the end. Now in Bible reckoning of time all the way from the book of Genesis God said the evening and the morning were the first day God's time clock does not start when the sun rises God's time clock starts when the sun goes down that's the beginning of the next day and the Jews reckon time the same way so you've got to understand that uh, when the Bible is giving times or days or things like that it, 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 it's in that context now the Sabbath, here, this Sabbath, again, was Saturday. However, when you read about leading up to the events of the crucifixion and it talking about the Sabbath being nigh, 
There were other Sabbaths. Any holiday, any Jewish holy day, that's what that word really means, was considered a Sabbath no matter what day of the week it would fall upon in that particular year. So they were, they were preparing to observe the Passover before Jesus was crucified. And the Bible is referring to that when it says the Sabbath was nigh. It's not talking about Saturday. It's talking about the Passover. Brother, I've got a ringing uh, in this microphone that's coming back. You want to maybe turn it down just a little. Thank you. So, Jesus, I, I hate to bust your bubble. He wasn't crucified on Friday. I don't know how people can figure three days and three nights. He said that, the scripture said it over and over. He would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How do you rise on Sunday morning or already be risen on Sunday morning and have Friday as the day you were crucified and have three days in between there? Just simple. That's Catholic tradition. It's been passed down through Protestants and Baptists and even picked up on in society. You need to get in your Bible. The Bible is the authority, not the traditions of men. Can I park here for just a second? You said the longer I preach, the more food they could cook. So you... <clears throat> One of the biggest problems, even in our Baptist churches, but in every church or denomination or even religion, if you want to call it, is that this word, this book, and I'm referring to the King James Bible, is not preeminent like we say it is. You say, what are you talking about? I don't understand. We, it's the sole authority for our faith and practice. Really? Where'd you come up with Good Friday? Hmm? Where'd you come? That's not Bible. The Bible gives it to you three days and three nights. In Matthew chapter 15, I've spent a months in our home church dealing with a series on the Word of God. One of the things I dealt with in Matthew chapter 15, don't turn there, you just, this is just free. This is a little something on the side. The same group of people, basically, the scribes and the Pharisees and the religionists of Jesus' day, came to him and said, Hey, your disciples are eating with their hands not washed, with unwashing hands. And they're, tra they're, they're trespassing the tradition of the elders. Now, if you don't understand what was happening there, the Jews claimed, the religious faction of them, claimed that when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai, and they were written in those tables of stone, and he gave him a, a lot of other commandments along with it. Uh, so they tell me there's 613. But God gave him that, those commandments in writing. They're in your Bible. But the Jews say that God also gave him an oral law that he spoke. And Moses didn't write it down, but he spoke it unto Joshua, his minister, his assistant. And Joshua passed it down through the judges and through the priests and all of this. And it got handed down orally uh, all the way to the time of Jesus. And this hand-washing business was part of that oral law. And how dare Jesus and his disciples trespass that oral law? But you know, he rebuked them for that. And he said, you by your tradition have made the commandments of God, the word of God of none effect. For God said, honor thy father and mother, and whoso curses father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, if a man has a gift that he wants to, I'm paraphrasing, has a gift, it calls it Corban. It's something dedicated that he can put in the offering at the temple that he can do that and he's free from taking care of his elderly father or mother. He said, you made the word of God none effect by your traditions, by your oral law, by your commandments. You know what they did? They took the word of God and, and they put it right here and they put their traditions above it their religious ideas, their teachings, their doctrines, what their Bible college had taught them. Can I help you with something? You do not filter this book through what you've been taught, 
through your commandments, through your traditions, through your doctrines. You filter all of your traditions and your doctrines and your teachings through this book. One of the biggest problems I've had with independent Baptists is trying to get them to see something from the Bible. I'm talking about now. Well, Dr. So-and-so taught me this. Yeah, but the Scripture says this. Yeah, but Dr. So-and-so said this. But the Scriptures say this. You see what they're doing? They're exalting, and I've seen it time. I'm talking about our brethren. Dr. So, Pastor So-and-so, Preacher So-and-so, this school taught this. My Bible college taught this. My group that I run with, my fellowship, my whatever. This is what they believe. Yeah, but what does the Bible say? So when we come to the Scriptures here, the Sabbath, again, this Sabbath in chapter 28 is Saturday, the ending of Saturday. So again, understanding that, it says, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, that Sunday, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. Now notice verse 4, And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Who are these keepers? Somebody tell me. Who are they? Are they the Jewish rabbis and priests and elders? No. Are they just some people that they pulled out, you know, from the town and deputized them? No. These are the Roman guards that are under the authority of Pilate and given that authority to these religious leaders of the Jews. They sent them to the tomb. And they sent them there for this reason, because... They came to Pilate and said, we remember, after Jesus was crucified, they came to Pilate and said, we remember that that deceiver, speaking of Christ, said he would rise again after three days. So in order to prevent a greater error and having his disciples come in night and steal away the body, give us, a, give us a guard, give us a watch, give us Roman soldiers to guard that tomb so that they cannot come and do that. And these are those Roman soldiers. These were the greatest fighting men of that time. These were men that knew war. These were men that were trained in hand-to-hand combat. These were big, burly, tough, hardened men. It was not some bunch of sissies. I don't want to go there. They didn't join the military to change genders. And... The Bible says in verse 4, for fear of this angel, the keepers, the guards, the Roman soldiers did shake and became as dead men. Like a stone. That's what the word astonished means. It it actually means become like a stone. Paralyzed with fear. The strongest most able-bodied fighting men of that day were paralyzed with fear at the appearance of this angel. Now let's read on for a second. I'm going somewhere. Please stay with me. It's going to take me a few minutes to get there, but I'm going somewhere. You know, it's kind of like if you're going down a course and trying to direct somebody, you try to funnel them down to something. You put something here and something here and something here and something here. But you're trying to funnel, you're trying to get to a point to direct. That's where I'm trying to go. So I may seem like I'm over here a minute and a little over here, but I'll get there. You'll stay with me. Verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. There's a sound of victory there. There's a sound uh, uh, of, of overcoming there. He is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and before, uh, behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, watch the following verses. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher. These are the women with fear and great joy and did 
run to bring his disciples word. Now notice verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, All hail, and all hail, and they came and held him by his feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, but go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now, verse 11. Now, when they were going, as, as they were going as he commanded, Behold, some of the watch. Now, that's back to these soldiers. These soldiers that guarded the tomb. These Roman warriors. Some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Now, I, I've read both of those scriptures in chapter 27 and chapter 28 for a reason. I'm going to build a point from there, but again, it's the point I'm trying to get to. So if you will allow me for a moment, let's look at something that is a stepping stone or building from there. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. With the help of the Lord, when I get back here, it'll become abundantly clear uh, what we're trying to bring out from the scripture back in Matthew chapter 27, chapter 28. Familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter uh, of the New Testament. Verse number one, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So what is Paul talking about? He's talking about the gospel, the good news, the gospel. And he says, it is by the gospel that ye also are saved, he said, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. You see, people that last for a little while and then go back to the old lifestyle, they believed in vain. They've had a head knowledge, but they don't have a heart knowledge. They believe in their mind the facts that Jesus was God, maybe, the Son of God, that he died on an old rugged cross, that he was buried, and that bodily he was raised from the dead three days later. But it's only gotten into their head. You do understand there is a vast difference. Head knowledge is a mental ascent. Heart knowledge is a moral action. When the Bible says to have faith or to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not talking about a head knowledge. It's not talking about believing that he died and was buried and rose again like you believe that George Washington was the first president or Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president. It's talking about a heart knowledge. The Bible says in the book of Acts that, that the Gentiles believing on God, that God purified their hearts by faith. It's a heart knowledge. It's a moral action of the heart. Uh, we got any theologians in here? Go, go, tell me which one's the theologian. One of you theologians, help me here. This is not a trick question. Where does sin take place? Where does it originate from? In the heart of man. In the heart. Then whatever God does in the atonement and through the gospel to change a man, it changes his heart, not just his head. Sin is the issue. The gospel is the cure for man's heart. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, verse 3, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is the Gospel. And that He was buried. And that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. But it doesn't stop there. It says, And that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part 
remain under this present, but some are falling asleep. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People say, oh, that's just a myth, that's just a fable. No, that is a historical fact. He was seen of the apostles. He was seen of Peter. He was seen of James. He was seen of more than 500 brethren at once. You commit a crime, a serious crime, a felony, a murder, let's say. And you are arrested and charged with that crime, and you are taken before a judge and put on trial for that crime. Do you know if two people, if two people say, I am an eyewitness, I saw him do it, that with the witness of two people, you can be put to death or put in prison for life based on what two people say they are eyewitness to. This Bible tells me, and it's an historical fact, that over 500 at one time saw Jesus Christ alive after his resurrection. That's a historical fact. And that's what we typically come to celebrate on this morning. But I don't want to stop there. I, I mean, I could go into the chapter more and more. The chapter describes about the resurrection. It describes about our resurrection and the kind of body that we're going to have. You do realize that body that you're in now, it's headed for one place. Right back in the dirt. Now, I know all of you want to have the a gorgeous physique like I've got you, man. I understand that. <laughs> It's not going to happen. You're going back in the ground. <laughs> I had one at one time, too, until diabetes took 40 pounds off me in three weeks, which I haven't been able to get back. Your body's heading in the ground. And I know the only exception is when the Lord returns in the rapture, uh, th that will be translated instantly if we're alive. Then. But if that doesn't happen in our lifetime, we're going in the ground. You see, because... It, 1 Corinthians describes this body like, like a grain, like, like a seed. In order for you to have a beautiful plant, whatever it is, a tree, whatever it is, a crop, you have to put a seed in the ground and the seed has to die. Right. And that's what's happening to this body. It's just a seed. It's just like a grain. It's going in the ground and it's going to dissolve and die. Right. So don't spend all your life all your effort taking care of this. I was preaching in the church a few weeks back, and I preached there for years. Preacher's a good friend of mine. And one of the ladies in the church afterward, we were all standing around talking and everything, said he's got such beautiful hair like a movie star. And I thought maybe Mr. Ed, but... No use pampering it too much. I mean, take good care of it as far as feed it, exercise, and all that. Don't do stupid things like smoking, drinking, drugs, and all that. That's just common sense. But this body's going to die. In 1 Corinthians 15, we see the historical fact of the resurrection. Go over to Titus now, if you will. I want you to see not only the historical part of the resurrection, but look in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, familiar passage. The Bible says in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All men, not all elect men, all men. Quit adding to the word of God, Mr. Calvinist. Teaching us, here's what the grace of God will do. You say you're saved. You say you've experienced the grace of God. It will teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Where? In this present world, right here, right now. If the grace of God didn't do that for you, you haven't experienced it. Looking. Here's what else it'll do. It'll teach you to be looking for the blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Notice what it says, that the grace of God causes us to look, in verse 13, for that blessed hope. Somebody know what the blessed hope is? Now, people think it's the second coming. No, it happens at the second coming. The blessed hope is the resurrection. That we will rise one day just like our Lord did. We're not staying in that ground. We're coming back out. And when we come back out, we're going to be much better off than we ever were before. We'll have a new body. We'll have a brand new life. We'll have a spiritual body. We look for that. That is the blessed hope. Those who have gone before us, those who have passed on, we don't sorrow as those that have no hope. We know that those that knew the Lord, we're going to see them again in the resurrection. So we have the hope of the resurrection. We have the history of the resurrection. We go back to Matthew, where we were at in chapter number 27. And this is new for me, seeing this this way just recently. I purposely read chapter 27 in the beginning verses and then read the verses later in chapter 28 of how the chief priest and the elders told the Roman guards to lie and gave money, say his disciples came and stole the body away. Let me ask you a question. And I love you, dear pastor, so don't take this the wrong way. But brother, if you had a spiritual need, if you needed an answer to something in your life that dealt with your spirituality, if you were carrying a burden, a sin, whatever it is, who would be the first man you'd want to talk to? Your pastor. You'd have confidence in your pastor that he would tell you from the Word of God the right thing to do. Is that not true anybody? And that is right. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm using this to show you something. When we see the scribes and elders here, the chief priest, do you realize who these people are? They are the religious leaders of the whole nation of Israel. So if anybody should be able to guide us, not only by their instructions, but by their life, but how they live, we should be able to look to these people if we were Jews in that day. These are the pastors, in a loose sense of the word, of the nation of Israel. Now look again at verse 1 of chapter 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people did what? Took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. What would you think if I got together a group of preachers and we sat down in an office or in a room somewhere in private, but it became known that we were in there plotting and scheming of how to kill another preacher? What would you think of us? You'd say, that's a bunch of hypocrites. That's a bunch of devils. What is wrong with them? They are supposed to be the ones that teach us how to respect other men of God. They're the ones that are supposed to show us how to live for God, how to love for God, what God is like. And yet here they are, plotting and scheming on how to kill Jesus. It doesn't strike you as wrong. Now, I'm going to try and show you something here, and some, it's, a, it's an unusual thought. But it's Bible. It's right here. And I've never heard anybody else touch on this until I did a little bit of studying. It was in some commentaries. But I, I'd already seen the point. I was just trying to, you know, grab anything I can get to help out. I want to deal here briefly with this. The hypocrisy surrounding the resurrection. We see the historical fact of the resurrection. We see the hope of the resurrection, and that's what we typically preach on, and that's right, and that's fine and good. I'm not not minimizing that in any way. But here, blatantly before, 
before our eyes is the hypocrisy around the resurrection. You see, the only reason Jesus is on trial is because these religious leaders don't like him. He's messed up their religious scheme. He's messed up what they're doing. He's exposing them for being hypocrites, and they don't like it. So rather than get right with God, they plot to kill him, to do away with him. Oh, don't sit there so smug. You did the same thing until you came to know him as Lord and Savior. Oh, you had all these good thoughts, and you would go to church maybe on Easter and have wonderful nights, but you didn't want a Jesus that was going to rule. You just wanted that nice little Jesus in the corner over there that was there when you, when you rubbed your uh, magic lamp and you needed him in an emergency or a situation you needed help out of. But the rest of the time, put him back on the shelf, put him over there, and keep him in his proper place. He's not going to come into my life and take over. See, he was coming into Israel and taking over as the Messiah, the ruler, the promised one, all through the Old Testament. He came to rule, and they said, no, you're not taking our place. And they plot and scheme the hypocrisy of these men. Now look here. Watch this. This is what struck me. Verse 2 says, when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then verse 3, Judas, then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed innocent blood. Now look at their response. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. Here they are trying to put a man to death, and the very one that helped them, the agent that they bought for 30 pieces of silver, comes back and says, I have sinned, I've betrayed the innocent blood. He's innocent. I cannot go through with this. What's that to us? See thou to that. Do you not see the hypocrisy here? Do you not see it? Look, read, read on. Here's what really got me when I saw this. Verse 5 says, And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for us to put them in the treasury because it is the price of blood. Oh, that would be against church policy. You're the one killing him. You're the one putting him to death. You're the one plotting. You're the one that paid this man to do it. That doesn't bother you. But we can't put that into the treasury. That would be against church policy. What hypocrites. What hypocrisy. They're all bound up again about some church, some religious tradition. They don't care that they're crucifying the Son of God, their Messiah. They're plotting and scheming. They're the ones orchestrating. Am I? Have you seen this kind of before? I've seen it with people. I've seen it with preachers. I've seen it with churches. I'm talking about Baptists. I am a Baptist. I was not born a Baptist. I was not raised a Baptist. I am a Baptist by conviction because I teach, uh, the Bible teaches that to me, is the closest faith to the New Testament. I study history. I study church history. I've studied... I'm a Baptist by choice and by conviction. And I'm talking about Baptists now. I'm not talking about the Catholics. I'm not talking about the chief priests and the Jews. I'm talking about the Baptists. I have watched Baptists. They will, they will, over some minor thing, and it might be right, but over some minor thing, They would die the death before they would violate it. And yet over some major thing, like rejecting the Lord, like not obeying the Bible, like not doing what the Scripture says, they'll reject it and have no qualms about it. They've got some excuse which overrules. Hypocrisy of the resurrection. But yet we say, we're born again. We're children of God. 
We've been saved by the Gospel. We believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've been raised to walk in newness of life since He saved us. And yet, we'll do something just like these scribes, Pharisees, elders, these religious leaders. Watch this. Now, I want you to see what their hypocrisy was in light of. That's what I'm, the point I'm going to try to make. What their hypocrisy continued in spite of, in light of what they knew and what they saw and what they experienced. First of all, they experienced the testimony of Judas Iscariot. If I say the name Judas Iscariot, you think of the worst person in history. The one that betrayed the Lord. The one that sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. The one that the Bible teaches us, he went, the Bible says even it says that he went to his own place. No greater villain than Judas. But brother, Judas did have enough decency to go hang himself after he'd done it. He did have enough decency to admit, I'm wrong, I betrayed the innocent blood. But we've got people today, whether they be church members, whether they be preachers, whoever they may be, whether they be occasional people that just come along and attend, you know, CME Christians. You know what they are, don't you? CME. Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. That's when they show up for church. CME Christians. By the way, a Catholic girl gave that to me when I was witnessing to her. She said, I'm a CME Christian. It doesn't matter. We've got folks that say we love Jesus, say He is the Savior, say He was he was crucified, buried, and He rose again bodily on the third day. They say they believe that. And yet their lives are filled with hypocrisy. They'll violate the biggest of Scriptures. The most blatant violation of Scripture. But yet they'll get all wadded up over one little tiny item. You know, Jesus described these people when He says, you people swallow a camel when you're trying to strain out a gnat. We got a lot of camel swallowers. That's what was wrong with these people. Here you are. You're the ones plotting. You're the ones scheming. You're the ones orchestrating his crucifixion. You're the ones that paid Judas. And in spite of his testimony that he betrayed the innocent blood, you don't repent. Instead, you come up with this thing. We can't put that in the treasury. Look on with me here. You know the story if you read through the text that he's brought before Pilate. And Pilate, uh, just for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to read just a couple verses. And Jesus, verse 11, stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou king of the Jews? And Jesus said, Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. In other words, yes, what you're saying is right. It's very emphatic the way that's worded. And when he was accused of the chief, here we go. When he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Pilate is the judge. It's the way it worked in the Roman government. You didn't have three different judiciary branches like Americans have. You're standing before that Roman governor who represents the emperor, and he is your judge, jury, and executioner. And he is standing there. They've put him on trial before Pilate because according to Roman law, and Romans ruled Israel at that time, According to Roman law, the Jews couldn't put people to death. They had to bring them before the Jewish or before the uh, Roman court to do it. And so that's what's happening here. And verse 13, And Pilate said unto them, Hearest thou not how many things they witnessed against thee? And he answered to him, Never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled. Why? Because they were all false accusations, and Pilate knew it. Not just the Jews. Pilate knew it. You say, where do you get that? Well, let's drop down a little and look at verse 18. Again, I'm trying to cover a lot of Scripture. Verse 18 says, For he, Pilate, knew that for envy they had delivered him. In other words, they were jealous. They were envious. The people were following him. If you'll remember, here we are. This is on a Wednesday. It's on the previous Sunday, just is that three days before? 
He'd come triumphantly. Jesus had come triumphantly into Jerusalem. And they were spreading palms in the way and saying, Hosanna, blessed is He that cometh in the name of the Lord. And now on Wednesday they're crying, crucify Him, crucify Him. It was for envy He was delivered. It's amazing how a crowd can be swayed. You say, oh, the majority can't be right. Well, tell, tell that to Jesus majority yelled out, crucify him, crucify him, because the religious leaders motivated them. The same crowd that was saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They were bowing down on Sunday, on Wednesday, crucified. And Pilate, the Bible says, knew that for envy, they, the religious leaders, had delivered him. Now look at verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So now we've got Pilate. And Pilate is going to say, I find no fault in him. Not one time. Not two times. Not three times, but if you study the Gospels, four times Pilate sat in that judgment seat and pronounced, I find no fault in him and these religious leaders. They hear that. They know the envy they had brought in there. Pilate knows about it. His wife even has this dream. You've got to watch out for those, but this one was a good one. My wife has some strange ones occasionally. <laughs> Relates them to me in the following morning. I said, don't do this on Sunday morning, please. I don't. I'm not preaching on dreams and visions. But the point I'm trying to make is the hypocrisy of these religious leaders. Anywhere in this process, they could have and should have somebody in that group should have said, wait a minute! He's innocent. Why are we doing this? He's the Messiah. If you study your Old Testament prophecies, every one of them that related to His first coming was being fulfilled in Him, and they saw it and they knew it. But they didn't want Him to rule. The hypocrisy surrounding the resurrection. Let me read on here. Verse 22, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Now I want you to drop down with me. I'm not going to take the time to describe and go through the crucifixion. I'm sorry, I just don't have it in this message. I'm trying to get to a point for you to really see something here. The Bible says in verse 35, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken up by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Again, Old Testament scripture being fulfilled. Look over, or drop down, and notice in verse number 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. How much of the land was in darkness? All. All. If I understand my Bible correctly, and my great exegesis of Greek words, that word all means all. Isn't that amazing? See, if you learn nothing else coming to church this morning, you learned it all means all. The Bible says from the sixth hour, that's 12 noon, according to how God, and, and, and they reckon time in Jewish, it started at 6 o'clock in the morning, went through to 6 o'clock at night. That, the first hour was 6 in the morning, so the sixth hour is 12 noon, the ninth hour is 3 p.m. For three hours... 
the Bible says there was darkness over all the land. Now, is that all the land of Israel? All the land of Palestine? Or all the land that's on this globe? Either way, the impact and the importance of it is right. the same. There was darkness so dark that you could not see your hand in front of your face. While the Lord Jesus Christ bore our sins on that cross and suffered the wrath and punishment of Almighty God for an eternity of sin so that you and I wouldn't have to. We're talking about hypocrisy now of these religious leaders. They're walking by right before this. They're reviling Him. They're wagging their heads and sticking out their chest and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple in three days and build it again, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. They're still in their hypocrisy. They're still trying to justify what they've done to the Son of God. Now look what happens. Darkness. Darkness that only God can create. Over all the land for three hours and at the end of that, verse 16, excuse me, verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You do realize, I, I don't know how to put it, I, I don't think tur- saying turning your back is the right word. God didn't turn his back when he was, Christ was on the cross. God poured out His full wrath upon Him because that's all He could do was sin. And Jesus was our sin. He became our sin. He bore our sin upon Him in those three hours of darkness. And God would not even let man see what was going on there between God the Father and God the Son. Jesus felt totally forsaken of man and of His Father also. He said, why hast thou forsaken me? Because He's bearing the sins of the world. And straightway, verse 48, one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to say him. They thought he was talking about Elijah. New Testament pronunciation, Elias. No, he was calling to his father, Eli, Eli. He said, let alone. The rest said, let be. Let's see whether Elias will come, verse 49, to save him. Now, I want you to notice verse 50. I'm getting to the end of my message and where I'm trying to get. And when he had cried again with a loud voice, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. No man takes his life from him. He had the power to lay it down. He had the power to take it up again. But he cries with a loud voice. Now, you've got to study all the Gospels to to put this together and to put the seven sayings of Christ on the cross in their order. So will you just trust me, I've got this one right. I have studied. This is not the first time I've read this or been here or preached here. What did Jesus cry with that loud voice before he yielded up the ghost? Yes. It is finished! It's done! The work of redemption, the atonement for sin, it is finished! Yielded up the ghost. You do realize, if you're ever going to be saved, you're going to come to that and realize that that is true, that there is nothing you or I could ever do to atone for our sins, that Christ did it all on the cross, and when He cried, it is finished! Finished! It was finished! The way of salvation, nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away. It's not you plus Him. It's Him and Him alone. He finished it on Calvary. You say, well, you know, you know I'm, I think I'm a pretty good person. If I hold out faithful to the end, that will help me get there. Oh, really? That, in addition to Calvary, in addition to the Son of God who hung on that cross bleeding and dying and suffering in our place and the one who said, it's finished! Somebody's telling a lie. It's either you or Him. In addition to somebody who says, well, now preacher, I have been baptized. 
Really? Bless your pea-picking heart. But if you're trying to bring that up as something that has to be done in addition to what he did when he said, It is finished! Then you're going to be damned and go to hell trusting in your right. baptism. Right. Oh, you say I keep the Ten Commandments. Really? Name them. Is there anybody in here who would even want to try and stand and name the Ten Commandments? I doubt five people in this room could do it. I have never seen one that claimed they were living by the Ten Commandments that could name any of them. And I've had them say that to me, and that's my response. Oh, tell me what they are. You can't even name them. You're telling me you're getting to heaven that way? You're telling me you're going to get right with God? You're a liar! Right. If you could keep the Ten Commandments and get to heaven that way, why did he die on that cross? Why? Paul said in I do not frustrate the grace of God, chapter 2, verse 19. I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, keeping the Ten Commandments, then Christ is dead in vain. You do realize if one person, just one human being throughout all of history, could get to heaven by keeping commandments, by holding on faithful to the end, by living right, by treating his neighbor good, by any of all these things you want to come up with, if they could get to heaven that way, then any other human being could, and it was not necessary for Christ to die on that cross. There is no other way but that cross. It is finished. Now we're talking about the hypocrisy surrounding the crucifixion and resurrection, the atonement. I want you to see this, and I'm getting right to where I want to be. Verse 50 said, when he, Jesus, had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. He cried, it is finished. What happened? Verse 51, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Two things here. Two things. Our Lord cries, It is finished. He yields up the ghost, the Spirit. And immediately at that same moment, in that, that beautiful temple that those Jews revered so much, that they worshipped so much, that was 40 and 6 years in building, in that temple, just like in the Old Testament tabernacle, there were two compartments inside there. The first compartment was where the uh, brazen altar were, was and things like that, where day by day, day after day, the priest would offer sacrifices on that brazen altar for the sins of the people as they brought them. And other sacrifices of thanksgiving and things like that. Day after day, day after day, year after year. Separating that first compartment in the tabernacle and in the temple was a huge veil. And behind that veil was the place called the Holy of Holies or the Holiest of All. Nobody could go into that compartment. That's where the mercy seat was with the cherubims. That's where the presence of God was represented right there. Nobody could go behind that veil except the high priest. And he could only do it on the Day of Atonement one time a year. And the Bible says he better not come in there the wrong way. He better not come without the blood. If he did... God would strike him dead. They tell us from commentaries and histories that they actually would tie a rope around the foot of that priest while he was behind that veil in case God did strike him dead. Nobody could go in there. They had to pull him back out. That's where God was. And that veil separated God from men. That veil said, you cannot come here. You cannot approach God. You're unholy. You're dirty. You're sinful. You're wicked. But God, God allowed a priest with the blood one time a year to come in there and represent man and place that blood as an offering upon that mercy seat once a year, separated by the veil. Preacher, I 
did some studying over the years on that veil. Now, this isn't in the Bible, so you have to take it from beyond the Bible, history books, commentaries. They say that that veil, and, and when they built the temple, this was the third temple, they built it much bigger than the tabernacle. That veil was 20 feet high, 30 feet wide, because they built the compartment of the Holy of Holies much bigger. That veil was the thickness of a man's hand, in thickness. At least four, five, six inches thick. It was huge. It was heavy. Brother, I could probably, I know you'd have to let me, I wouldn't do it. I could probably, if, if that shirt wasn't on you, I could probably rip that shirt. I'm just an average man. Who's the strongest one in here? You look like a big, strong fellow. Yeah, <laughs> he might be able to take it if it's doubled over and rip it. Fold it the third time, I doubt if any man in here could tear that shirt. We're talking about a veil as thick as a man's hand. Goodness knows how much it weighed. And that veil kept man from God. It separated him. They say that after that thing was woven, they tested it to make sure it wouldn't tear by taking 12 yoke of oxen, tying it to the ends of it, and making them pull against each other. That's how thick and how strong that veil was. It stopped you and me and all men from entering the presence of God. Only the high priest who was typical of Christ offering the blood was allowed in there and only once a year. And the Bible says when Christ cried with a loud voice, it is finished that that veil was rent from the top to the bottom. God tore it. And there lay open the Holy of Holies for all, this, all these religious leaders, all these priests, all these elders that wanted to crucify yes, Jesus. They had the testimony that God rent the veil. Yes, sir. Top to bottom, not from bottom to top. And there that Holy of Holies lay open. The moment Jesus gave up the ghost and said it is finished. But I read not only that. We're talking about now all of these things that witness against these people that should lead them to repentance. Not only is the, temp uh, the temple with the veil torn in two, but look at verse 52. Well, let's back up 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Rent means to be torn. You ever been in an earthquake? I was in one. We had one in Virginia, I don't know, eight, ten years ago. I don't know if you remember. Started over in Mineral, Virginia. It was 7.6 or something. I was standing upstairs in a house. It was a smaller Cape Cod house. And the front of it was here, but beside the house, the road went down. And went, so the front of the house is about one story. The back of the house is about four. And... I'm standing there talking with the homeowner. Here's the gable in. Here's the radiator right here. I'm talking with the homeowner. This earthquake starts. It's going on. This cast iron radiator is standing there going whop, 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 back and forth. The whole place is shaking. They had a guy outside removing a tree with one of these big hooks right next to the corner of the house. We thought he'd hit the house with the tree. We came outside. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. But that time somebody comes running over from the neighbor and says, an earthquake. This earthquake, the moment he said, it is finished. Veil was rent. The rocks split open. They were torn apart. But look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. It says, and what? The graves were opened. The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto men. Now, you've been very patient, so I'm going to try and finish very quickly here. 
He cries, it is finished. The veil is torn. The rocks are torn. The graves begin to open. A lot of those graves were just like Christ. They were covered with a rock. They were hewn in stone. And now here they are laying open. And the dead, the saints, come out of those graves and appear unto many. But when do they do it? Not at the moment that He cried it's finished. Not at the moment of the rending of the veil or the tearing of the rocks. After His resurrection. That means that those graves lay open with those dead bodies, those decaying bones, the stench and anything that was left. For three days they were open for anybody in Jerusalem to see. There these dead bodies are. But on the third day, after His resurrection, they came up out of the graves and they appeared unto many. And yet these hypocrites still said, He's not going to rule over us. He's not going to. We're going to continue with our lie. We're going to tell people that His disciples came and stole Him away. Imagine something with me. Imagine a rabbi, let's say, a religious leader. Those graves have been opened three days. (coughs) After His resurrection, Christ's resurrection, these dead saints arrive. And they go into the city and they appear. Imagine with me, this is just kind of whimsical, but I think it's accurate. Imagine a rabbi. Let's just say it's Nicodemus. Will that work? Nicodemus. And imagine Nicodemus is going into town that day after all of this has happened. and He's walking down the street. He's, he's going to a market. He's doing whatever. And, and all of a sudden, he looks up. Ma! My mama! No! Mom! Mom! I'm saying, Mama, is that you? And she says, Yes, it's me, Nicodemus. And she says, Nicodemus, you remember the Messiah that I taught you about in Isaiah chapter 53? That he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. You remember him, Nicodemus? You remember the one Nicodemus that I told you about in Psalm 22 where they looked on him whose hands and feet they pierced? You remember that one? That's Nicodemus. Jesus is that Messiah. Jesus is the one that has been raised from the dead. And He's taking us with us. Come be with us in heaven, Nicodemus. Trust Him. How could anybody in Jerusalem with all of these events at that time frame during those days seeing and experiencing all this and again all the prophetic scriptures that hung all over Jesus. He was just filled with them. Ready for them. How could they still say I'm not going to have that man to rule over me. He's not the real Messiah. I'm going to follow our religious leaders. They're so honest and upright. You know, we're living in the day where people are finally waking up about following everything the government says, following everything the news media says, following everything the leaders say. Oh, we've got to shut the church down. You know, we're going to all die of COVID. They didn't shut the liquor stores down didn't shut Home Depot Lowe's down. It's funny. We still went there. You see, we're back to do we believe the Bible and what that book says about Him. About Him being Lord of all. And that for this reason, to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that He might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Romans 14. Or are we going to be like the religious? Oh, we'll come. We'll have Easter service. We'll go. We'll smile. We'll say we're Christians. But He's not going to tell me what to do. He's not going to change my life. 
he's not going to have full commitment from me that he can do whatever he wants with me. Some of you God's been dealing with about getting saved, really getting saved. Stop playing church. Stop playing church. Stop playing Christian. You've made professions of faith. You've come, but you know that Christ is not your Lord in your heart. You're doing just like this. It's hypocrisy. My, uh, be honest one way or another. Just I would say at least that Judas, I've sinned. I'm wrong. These guys, we're not going to have him rule over us. Be sincere. Be sincere. And say yes. Yes, I choose to allow you to be my Lord and Master. I trust you as my Savior. And mean it. Which is it with you? There's some that God's dealing with you about something in your life. Yes, you're a Christian. But you know God's dealing with you about something. I don't know. All I know is He's doing it. That's why He told me to preach this. He's dealing with you about something and you're resisting. Excuses. You're putting it off. You're trying to back away from it. Whatever it is. Let him have his way. Let him. That's what Christian, that's what the resurrection is all about. Is that he is the risen Lord in my life as well as in everybody else. Preacher, I'm good. Misty comes to the piano to play this morning to play. Lord spoke to your heart this morning, you'd like to come. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning, we'd like to take some time to show you from the scripture how the Lord can save you, how you can be saved. Or maybe as he mentioned there at the end, maybe you are saved, and the Lord's been dealing with you about something. Why don't you come and get that right this morning? And uh be a good time to do business with the Lord. While she plays this morning, would you like to come? Anybody at all like to take just a few minutes and do some business with the Lord? Sure appreciate the good preaching. Thankful for what the Lord has done for us on the cross. The only way we can get to God is through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to get there by your good works or your good deeds or your church membership. Anybody at all want to come? Not going to take a lot of time, but we certainly want to give you an opportunity. Religion will never get you to heaven. You'll have to have Jesus. Father, thank you for the preaching today. Thank you for the Savior. Thank you that our God is alive and well. Thank you for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad, Lord, that you've risen in my heart. I'm thankful, Lord, that one of these days you're going to raise this body, either from this earth or from the grave, and we're going to forever be present with you. Looking forward to that day, and I pray, Lord, that folks here know Jesus as their Savior, and I pray that they're looking forward to that same day as well. Lord, we thank you for being good to us this morning. Thank you for the good singing, the good preaching, the good time together, and we sure do love you, and thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed in prayer. We'll ask the blessing over the food, and uh, you'll be dismissed to go to breakfast. I hope you'll eat breakfast with us. hope all of you will stay and eat breakfast with us this morning, and come, we'll come right back in here at 11 o'clock, and uh, we'll have preaching again and singing again and fellowship again, and uh, that'll be a great blessing. So I hope you'll do that, and I hope all of you will stay and eat with us as well. Good